All right, so we will be talking about Oktoberfest, and this is a 100% illustrated guide. I lied, all right, about 90%. There's some things that I thought pictures and art uh, that of historical value would do better than my, co my uh, comics. I want to make sure I give the breadth of what we're talking about here. Uh, so first and foremost, we're going to be talking about how to taste beer. So if you do have a beer in front of you, um, this is, don't let the Oktoberfest uh, two roads, this is Bitburger's Fest beer. Uh, a little bit of a misnomer, Fest beer should not be this color. I did not drink this until I uh, opened it. Uh, this is American, so they lied to me, but that's okay. Uh, they're German, so they can get away with it. So what we're going to do, if you've got a beer in front of you, is you're going to put it on the table or a surface in front of you, and you're going to swirl it about um, 45 RPM or so, just to release, you want to release the aroma. So giving it a good swirl, or you can do it, you know, like this a little, agitate it a little. You want to get that head retention up. And you're going to want to give it two quick sniffs. So, and think about what you're smelling. Did you get the malt? Did you get the hops? Um, I'll go through the difference between a Meritzen and a Fest beer. They are different beers. Um, and then what you're going to do is the best part is the drinking part. So let's give, a, if you've got a beer in front of you, or if you don't, no big deal. I'm going to give it a taste. You want the beer to kind of sit in your mouth for a couple seconds before you swallow it. When beer warms up, flavor mo molecules are agitated uh, and it releases more flavor. And then when you swallow, you blow out through your nose. That's called retronasal olfaction. There is actually a sense of smell all the way in the back of your throat. Uh, it's a really fascinating um, phenomenon where you smell in the beginning, but when you blow out, you'll get a completely different smell sensation. So I'm, just, I'm gonna have a little more beer. And yeah, there's a sweetness in the back. Uh, it's a really interesting thing when you realize that there's taste and um, aroma sensation all through your head. It's kind of fascinating. And the breathing out through the nose really helps with um, getting the whole aroma and sensory experience. So what's a Meritzen? A Meritzen is um, a beer that is this color, usually amber or so, uh, can be darker. It was invented by Spaten, which is a brewery in Munich starting in 1841. Uh, beers of this nature were really hard to make because they didn't have the technology to create the malt, the amber colored malt. And in 1841, Spaten um, and their buddies in uh, Vienna, the dryers, uh, created Vienna and Munich malt, and hence a Merzen. So if you've ever had a Vienna lager, a Vienna lager is a lower alcohol, non-fest version. Fest strength being this beer is for a party, so it's going to be higher alcohol. We're talking about 5.8 to 6.2 percent ABV. Uh, this beer was not the original beer served at the Oktoberfest. You're talking about a dark beer or a dunkel uh, that would be served first um, because they didn't have the technology in malting to brew a amber colored lager in Munich at that time. So the Meritzen was first served in the 1870s. Uh, it can be deep gold or so. Usually when you see it in America, it's gonna be amber to even almost like a dark, deep amber, um, maybe even bordering on a light brown or so. Um, Meritzen does mean March in English. The historical behind that is that breweries would brew their last beer of the year in March. They were not allowed to brew in the summer. It was illegal because when you're lagering, it's too hot and the beer would spoil. So it was illegal to brew in the summer. So they would only brew from around like October to March or so. And so they would make this last beer, lay it down in the lagering caves for the whole summer, deep in the mountains, and then they would drink it at, at a harvest time and party, hence the Meritzen. Um, historical Meritzens were not this color, they were darker. Um, other brewing societies also make a Meritzen. There's a beer to Mars, which is equivalent, a very similar profile, a little fruitier, it's also can be an ale, so it's a little different. Now we're gonna talk about fest beers. Um, fest beers, 
is like a strong Helles. Helles is the modern, most popular beer in Munich, where Oktoberfest is held. Um, it's a beer that was invented in the late 19th century when Munich discovered that if they boiled their water before they used it, they could remove the temporary hardness, the minerals in the water, and create lighter beers. Uh, when you have minerals in, um, in your water supply and hard water and you try to brew a light beer, it turns really bitter and gross. Uh, you don't want that. So when they discovered temporary hardness and could get rid of that, they could brew a Helles or a Golden Lager and mimic the Pilsner, which was a very, very popular beer of the middle to late century and into the, like, into the 20th century and into now, which it's mostly morphed into a international pale lager, American light lager. So the proto beer of all golden lagers was a Pilsner. This, the Helles was the beer that Munich created to kind of mimic the hype as so. So the Fest beer was invented in the 1950s by Augustiner, which is a very famous brewery in Munich, um, and was officially adopted in the 1990s by Oktoberfest because people wanted a lighter beer that they felt was less filling, but still the same alcohol strength. Um, I bought Bitburger. So Bitburger is a brand in Bitburg, Germany. They are not allowed to call it a Fest beer uh, in Germany. They can call it a Fest beer here. Uh, in Germany, only the breweries based in the Munich proper can make Merzens and Fest beers. No one else in Germany can create these beers. They have a lock on it. It's kind of like champagne coming from France. So in America, those rules do not apply. So we can brew whatever we want. And Bitburg, where it says Fest beer, they come to America. Americans think that Fest beers and Oktoberfest should be dark. Hence, I should have realized when I bought this that it was going to be amber, but I didn't. Um, a lot of really good breweries, uh, Counterweight Brewing in Hamden makes a really good Fest beer. Uh, I work at Fox Farm Brewing. Um, this is a, essentially a Fest beer. It's a little too dark. Uh, Fest beers are going to be usually deep amber or deep blend or so, um, but alas. Um, so that's what a Fest beer is. And that's when you go to Oktoberfest now and you order a beer, they're going to give you something that's golden. Uh, it freaks a lot of uh, tourists out when you think Oktoberfest, you think this, then you go to the actual Oktoberfest and they serve you something that doesn't look like that. But that's what you're going to get. Uh, Fest beers are delicious. Uh, big fan. So, give me a second. So we're going to talk about the history of Oktoberfest. And the best part about Oktoberfest is it starts, uh, what day is it today? It's the 13th or 14th of October. So it's October 12th, 2000, or 2000, wow. Let's not go, we'll go back a little bit. 1810, and these two little birds are gonna get married. They actually don't really like each other. Uh, he cheats on her a bunch. It's not a great match, but it's fine. It's royalty, it's the 19th century. And this is Prince Ludwig. He is later King Ludwig of Bavaria. He marries the Princess Theresa of, I'm, oh, uh, one side note, I do not speak German, so I apologize for the butchering of the German language. I deeply, deeply apologize if you speak German. So just a heads up with that. Um, so she's from Sachs uh, Hil Hilberghausen, which is in South Central Germany. Um, she was actually supposed, she was on the short list to marry Napoleon, which I think is fun. But she marries Ludwig, and they get married on October 12th, to the, uh, there we go again, 1810. And the entire city of Munich is invited afterwards for a party in the Wiesen, which is valley, uh, or uh, meadow, excuse me, next to the city gates. Uh, everyone's drinking beer, having a good time. Everybody loves it. A week later, they have a horse race. Uh, 40,000 people arrive, and they drink in the grandstand, which is on a hill, uh, and watch this crazy horse race. Everyone's having a blast and everyone goes, wow, I know this is a wedding, but we really should do this every year. And so they did. Um, the very next year, it turns into an agricultural fair uh, as well as a horse race. Uh, unfortunately in uh, 1812, it is paused for the Napoleonic Wars. I will get through when other times the, um, the Oktoberfest has been postponed uh, since considering today and other times in history. Um, so everyone has a really great time 
And then this is, I wouldn't do it justice. So this is the painting of one of the original Oktoberfest. Everyone's outside, they're drinking beer. They're not just drinking beer, they're drinking wine. German has, Germany has a wonderful wine culture. Wine is a very important part of Oktoberfest as well. When you go to Oktoberfest, you don't have to drink beer. It is a very big part, of, important part, but it's not the main part. So you can drink wine, there's cocktails and all that sorts of stuff. So everyone's in there, they're drinking wine, they're drinking beer, they're watching the horse race, they're having a great time. And in 1818, they add rides and carnival games as well. It's a very big, the amusement park section of Oktoberfest is a big part of the Oktoberfest, especially for families, especially if you ride it before you go to the beer tent. <laughs> that's a big thing. Don't, that's apparently a big thing. Don't ride the ride after you drink the beer. Um, I really love how one of the first prizes that you could win in the beer, excuse me, in the um, carnival games were not just a stuffed, you know, it wasn't just a stuffed animal. You could win silver, you could win porcelain, you could win jewelry. So it was a big incentive to go and play, have a great time. And in 20, and uh, sorry, in 1819, the town of Munich, or the city of Munich decides, this is a blast. We're going to do it every year. And that's how Oktoberfest started. So the traditional Oktoberfest starts with a parade on the first Sunday. Uh, the head of the parade is the Muchner Kindle. Um, the Muchner Kindle is on the coat of arms. It's a child that wears a monk's robe. Um, it's, it used to be back in the day, I think the original, I have in my notes when the parade started um, in its current form, but it's the head of the parade is now, it used to be a child, it didn't matter what gender, um, but mo in modern times, it is a beautiful woman and she rides a horse and she wears the monk's robe and holds in this like kind of stuffed beer. It looks very silly. Um, right behind her is the mayor of Munich and their families. And then 8,000 people in traditional costume march behind them. But not just the other people that march behind them, the breweries also create elaborate floats that are drawn by horses that carry some of the beer. It's a ceremonial thing. And they carry it down um, to their respective tents. Uh, they're really beautiful, very decorated, lots of flowers and barrels, um, people on board drinking and having a good time. Um, it's a great celebration, a really, really nice event to start Oktoberfest. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about the Dirndl and Lederhosen. So Lederhosen is um, English for leather breeches. It is a classic outfit of not just Germany, but a lot of other places in Central Europe, Eastern Europe. Uh, it's workwear uh, made with tanned leather um, deer skin. Very easy, very strong, very easy to work in. It's made for very tough physical labor, uh, the originator of it. Uh, now um, it's adorned with, if you're um, the men's lederhosen is adorned with lots of um, beading, or not beading, uh, like, um, embroidery and whatnot. Um, usually you wear it with the socks, the, um, the checkered shirt, the hat. Um, Lederhosen, very, very prized. Uh, it's usually passed down from father to son, a big part of German culture when you get your dad's Lederhosen. Um, boys uh, traditionally used to wear Lederhosen until they were 16, and then boys' Lederhosen are much shorter and not adorned at all. They're more for a uniform. Oh, wait, I'm going to talk about the Dirndl, excuse me. And then the Dirndl is based off an 18th century uh, alpine costume that was worn by peasants. Um, normally it would be two pieces. Uh, dirndls in the 30s became one dress. It used to be a corset and then a dress and then the apron. Um, you wear a blouse with it. It is a big faux pas to not wear a blouse. Uh, my sister went to Munich. She did not wear a blouse under this later, um, excuse me, this dirndl. Uh, that's a big no-no. I'm not really sure why it's a faux pas. I think it's a cultural Thing. Um, the dirndl uh, must have the blouse as well. Um, it comes with an apron. There's one pocket instead of two. That is for dancing. So when you can hook, um, 
for traditional dancing. I use it to call my cell phone, <laughs> but I don't think that's the original, uh, original use for that. Um, but it's a beautiful outfit. I am wearing my dirndl now. This was bought by my sister actually and given to me. Uh, she bought it in Munich, so at the Oktoberfest. I do want to talk about the hats. Everyone recognizes the Tyrolean hat. Um, it is a Gamsbart. So it's a green alpine hat, usually with feathers or flowers and a chamois at the top that's made of hair. And the more hair you have, the, the brown hair, uh, the wealthier you are. So if you look at certain pictures where the guy has a ton of it, that is a rich man and you befriend him. Um, if you have less or so, it means that you don't have a lot of money. Traditionally, that's what um, the chamois hair meant. So we're gonna talk about beer. So after the um, parade happens, the brewery, um, sorry, where's the, they all go to the Spaten tent. And the Spaten tent is the uh, Bavarian minister is there, the Bavarian, uh, the Mayernik, and lots of dignitaries. And they have a ceremonial tapping of the first keg. Um, the mayor taps the keg, he pours the beer, he gives the first leader, goes to the Bavarian um, president uh, minister, and then they say, Uptacht is, which is, it is tapped. Apparently this tradition is an accident that comes from 1950, when we have to talk about Thomas Wimmer. So after Thomas Wimmer, there is a bet with how many times it's gonna take the mayor to tap the keg. Um, the fastest it's ever was the early, 19, uh, the early 20th, uh, 21st century, excuse me. Uh, it only took two times. Thomas Vimmer shows up, he's elite, he's confused. Uh, he goes, he's like, I gotta tap the keg. He tries, he can't do it. He tries again, he can't do it. He tries again. It takes him 19 times. And after the 19 times, he goes, oh, that says, it is tapped. I'm done, it's tapped. And so you have to say it the way he does when you tap it. No one, it's never taken anyone 19 times to tap the keg. That's the record. Uh, this happened in 1950. So after the spot and keg is tapped, 12 gunmen go outside, and shoot their guns in the air, and that's how all the other tents know it's time to drink beer. This starts at high noon after the parade. Um, but yeah, you can bet in Germany and like around the world, you can bet how many times it's going to take because they love to gamble. So it's a very like, you can, you can bet on how many times it's going to take the mayor to tap the keg. I think that's very funny. So the breweries that still shoot the guns today, is this like what's going on right now? Um, well, the Oktoberfest isn't happening this year because of the, of COVID, but yeah, you can, that's how they do it every year. They shoot the guns in the air and that's the start. So because Oktoberfest is so large and the tents are so massive, they hold thousands and thousands of people. The way to get everyone's attention is to shoot a 12, it's a 12 gun salute. And that says, all right, let's start drinking. And they do. Um, the breweries that are allowed to pour at Oktoberfest are Augustiner, Hockersfor, Hofbrau, Lowenbrau, Paul Anner, and Spaten. No one else is allowed to pour at Oktoberfest. These are breweries within the walls of Munich. They're historically important. They've been around for hundreds of years, um, and they are very, very culturally important to the city of Munich. Therefore, these are the places that are allowed to pour. They each set up their own tent or tents. Paul Anner, I believe, has three or four. One of them is a thousand seat, essentially a nightclub that's very expensive and hard to get into. It caters to celebrities and it's open later than all the other tents. Most tents close at 11, that tent closes at 12.30. So tents, the tents are massive. I did not draw a picture of it because I want how large it was. Um, this is the Augustiner tent. I believe it holds five or 6,000 people just inside. Uh, outside, there's usually a couple thousand people that can sit outside. During the day, they play uh, polka music. There is a decibel limit of 85 decibels, so it caters to families and older people. So every, you can have a quiet conversation, enjoy yourself, have lunch, um, have a snack, drink your beer. Um, after uh, 5 p.m., the decibel level can be raised. They can play lots of other 
rowdy music, uh, the folk music goes away, there's electronic, it gets, it gets real rowdy. And that's when at night it can get more rowdy. Um, let's see, just look at the notes. The largest tent is the Polaner tent. Polaner holds 8,450 people. Um, that is not the largest tent that's ever been built in 1910. I don't know what brewery it was, built a tent for 12,000. Um, which I think is massive. That's, I don't even know how 12 people can fit, be like a concert venue or a, a stadium or something like that. And tents aren't just for beer. There's tents for chicken, tents for that specialize in ox, specialize in wine uh, or lower alcohol beers, uh, cocktail tents, um, all sorts of stuff. Coffee, there's a coffee tent um, for non-alcoholic beverages. So there's a lot of stuff uh, that the tents have. And it's a really big draw. Um, Augustiner is the most popular and beloved brewery by locals in um, Munich. So if you're looking for a real local experience, I recommend going to the Augustiner tent. Um, Americans tend to go to either the Hofbrau tent um, or what's the other one? I believe the Polaner tent also is pretty popular with, um, with international people. Uh, so most of the, to be fair, most of the people that go to Oktoberfest are locals, uh, more than 50%, and I'll get to that as well. Um, what do you eat at Oktoberfest? You eat the pretzel. And the, yep, everyone's got their pretzel. Um, the pretzels at the Oktoberfest uh, are scaled. So I, I, I drew this picture for scale, and they are the size of your head. They're massive, big, chewy pretzels, salted. Um, they come either with food, they'll come with mustard. Um, there for sharing or not. Great way to soak up the alcohol that you're drinking. Great way to get yourself filled. Um, it's, I, when I saw a picture the first time of the, uh, the pretzel, I was like, oh my God, that thing is massive. And like literally this big. Um, they don't mess around. The Bavarians love their pretzel. It's a very integral part of their culture. Also the pork knuckle. So the pork knuckles are bone in pork piece comes with gravy. It also comes with a dumpling, uh, which looks kind of like a piece of bread. It can be bread. It's either old bread or old potato. And then it's kind of molded into this egg shape. Uh, I've never eaten one. I don't know what it tastes like. Um, but it is very in interesting and delicious. I was supposed to go to Germany this year. Um, my flight was going to leave March 29th. Obviously, you all know what happened. So that did not happen. Um, I'm itching to go. I'd love, love, love to go to Germany, I, to Cologne, which is, that's the fascinating part about Germany is each city has its own unique beer culture uh, and they are, couldn't be different from one another. Um, that's a really fascinating part about Germany. So everyone's eating the pork knuckle and you got to have your beer. So the beer is served in a one liter Mosskrug. I have one for, for scale. Uh, a server can fill this in a second and a half and they can carry, I believe, I think it's like at least 15 or so. I don't know how they do it because this thing on its own weighs a ton. Um, but yeah, Mas Krug, Mas uh, in English just essentially means pitcher. And this is 33, this is a liter, so about 33 ounces or so. So about a quart pitcher. Um, it is not a stein. A stein is, stein is stone in Germany. This is a stein. So an earthenware stone. So moss, stein. Um, a stein would be made of earthenware. Um, I have a half liter uh, moss uh, just because I, I, I didn't want to fill this because this is very foreboding and scary. Uh, I am a, as, even though I am a beer person and I work in the beer industry, I'm a real lightweight. So that, uh, that's just going to go over there. Um, but you're going to drink the moss. And I've, I've, and it's going to be full of that golden liquid, the fest beer. What happens if you get sick at Oktoberfest? You drink too many moss krugs, you eat too much pork knuckle. There are a hundred doctors on staff for the Oktoberfest. All are working from the German Red Cross. Uh, they will take care of you. Uh, there is a large police presence the whole time. It's very secure, very safe. Um, so if you do get sick and you need help or you need to stay hydrated, there are doctors there to help you out. Uh, some fun facts. Uh, they added electric lights 
in 1880 to the Oktoberfest, and the first bratwurst was served just a year later. Um, bratwurst is not, it's a more of a modern sandwich. I know a hot dog's not a sandwich or whatever, but it's a modern conveyance. So a first bratwurst was served in 1881. And then the first glass beer mug was 1892. Um, Industrial glass making started around like 1850 or so, but didn't really pick up until like the late 19th century. So before at the um, mid 19th century, everyone would be drinking out of these earthenware mugs or steins. How much trash does an Oktoberfest create? A hundred tons, a thousand tons, which I think is just crazy. I also learned that the bathroom line can get so long that because people want a place to look quietly, use their phones. So they put, um, they put cell phone blocking towers around the bathroom. So you don't get cell phone service in the bathroom. So you can't sit on your phone. Um, I think that's very, very funny. That's a new thing. Um, so if you're looking for a quiet place, Oktoberfest is not it. It's going to be rowdy. It's going to be fun. You're going to have a great time. Some more fact, uh, facts. It is the world's largest folk festival. It is eating and drinking, but there's still an agricultural aspect of it. There's still rides, games. Uh, they have an original Oktoberfest that they put in in 1810 where the rides are cheaper and you can see how it was back in the day. Typically the Oktoberfest lasts 16 to 18 days, depending. The last day is always German Unity Day. Um, that was a change in the 20th century. So if German Unity Day lasts or ends in like October 4th or so, um, they will extend it an extra day just so it always ends. Um, Oktoberfest did used to start in October, but they did move it to September because of the warmer weather. Uh, middle of October in Munich, probably getting kind of chilly, get a little cold, they're in the foothills of the Alps. So moving it to the middle of September just made sense for festival goers. Um, COVID-19 is not the first cancellation for any kind of um, epidemic. It has been canceled twice. There were two cholera epidemics that canceled it. Um, so that has happened. Um, it's only been canceled 25 times. Uh, the last time was in 1949 after World War II. Um, so it's been a really long time. It's always been happening. Um, the thing I also find most fascinating about Oktoberfest is it is incredibly LGBTQ friendly. Uh, this started in the 1970s when a group from the Munich Lions Club, no relation to the Lions Club of America, the Munich Lions Club is a leather and fetish club, um, booked the Hawkers 4 tent. The Hawkers 4 people thought a soccer team was coming. Um, the soccer team did not show up. A men, uh, men in a lot of leather showed up. Uh, Hoggers 4 thought this was hilarious, but also wonderful, invited them in, let them have their event, and invited them back the next year. Um, they opened them, they had open arms for um, the Munich Lions Club. So now the Oktoberfest is one of the world's largest gay celebrations. Um, almost every tent has a gay night. Uh, I was talking to, uh, I was doing a talk for someone else, and the guy was gay, and he was like, I went to Oktoberfest, it was the best day of my life. Like, he, it, it's, a, it's a huge phenomenon. It's the second largest uh, gay event in Germany outside of um, a different, I forget what the first one is. Um, so it's a very big uh, LGBTQ friendly event. Um, and they make sure that it, and it's been that way since the 70s. This is pretty fascinating. So how much beer is actually drank at Oktoberfest? 62,000 gallons were drank in 2015. That's enough to fill almost three Olympic sized swimming pools. Um, about 6.2 million people go to Oktoberfest and 6.7 million liters are drank. So almost everyone has a beer or more than a beer. One of the popular um, souvenirs to get is a gingerbread heart. Uh, you get whatever you want written on it. You can hang it. You do not eat it. It is, oh, sorry, I have a grandfather clock <laughs> that always goes off. Give me a second. Everyone have a sip of beer. Sorry about that. This is not for eating. Do not try to eat this cookie. It is inedible. It's hard as a rock. 
but it's a decorative piece. A lot of people get them as Christmas decorations or they put them in restaurants or they hang them on the walls. Uh, you can get whatever you want written on them. Um, it's a really cool, fascinating phenomenon. I saw that and I was like, that looks delicious. Uh, and then I read, you do not eat them. So I would have 100% tried to eat it because <laughs> I can't help myself. So of the 6.7 million people that go to the Oktoberfest, 72% of them are from Bavaria, uh, which means that, yeah, a lot of people are coming from America, Australia, and Asia, but the major the, by far the majority of the people who go to Oktoberfest are locals. Uh, it's a very, very important part of Bavarian culture. Uh, Bavaria has 13 million people in it. So you're looking at about 40 or 38 percent of the population shows up to this event. Um, that's pretty fascinating. Um, they're very proud of Oktoberfest. They're proud of what or they're proud of vintage. And if you meet any Bavarian, they're going to talk about what they love uh, from. Um, they're very, very, very like. Um, very like they just love Bavaria. They're really into it. I've never been. I was supposed to go, um, but if you meet someone from Bavaria, ask them about it. They'll tell you everything. They love where they're from. Uh, talk. So, I have any questions about Oktoberfest? Um, anything at all? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I have a box farm brewery. Um, it's a small brewery in Salem, Connecticut. Here's what their cans look like. Um, it's a brewery that was started in 2017 by a guy named Zach Adams and his brother, Dave. Uh, it's a very small farm brewery. They retrofitted a barn that was built in the 1960s as a dairy barn and uh, made it into a brewery. We've got a 20 barrel brew house. Uh, we also specialize in any, um, a lot of styles we do, um, a lot of hazy IPAs, but our passion is lagers. We have two horizontal lagering tanks. Uh, when you make lager, um, you can make lager in a normal fermenter, which is going to be uh, vertical. That's fine. But there's something about horizontal lagering tanks that lets the yeast clarify more naturally and slower. Uh, and it'll settle on the bottom, makes for a clearer beer. Um, I don't know if this was made. So if you can look at how clear lagers are. That's just time. They don't, most breweries don't or shouldn't really need to filter their beer. It's just time um, where it'll get that clear. Uh, and that's the benefit of having a horizontal lagering tank is just traditional as well. Um, Budweiser, it's all, if you ever go to out on Budweiser tour, actually I highly recommend taking a tour of Budweiser. Um, the fascinating part of it is how engineering and food science heavy it is versus the brewing aspect, uh, but their lagering, their horizontal lagering tanks are like three times the size of my house. Like it's massive. Um, but Fox Farm, we are currently our curbside only because of the pandemic, but we do, uh, we are distributed to some restaurants. Uh, we don't make it to Fairfield County as much as I'd like. Um, we are served in uh, New Haven County, um, but we're a very small brewery as well. We only make 2,000 or so barrels a year, which makes us a very small brewery. Um, we also make a lot of sours as well. We have a special barn that we built just for sours. Uh, when you brew, you kind of don't want your clean, what you call clean beers, your lagers, IPAs, um, near anything that uses wild yeast, Britannomyces, or lactobacillus, things that make beer sour because you can cause uh, cross-contamination and create beer, make beer that aren't supposed to be sour, sour, and it's a big mess um, to try to clean. We built a special barn just for our um, mixed fermentation, regular ale yeast, but then you also use um, soury bacteria and Britannomyces and wild yeast um, to slowly ferment the beer out a little longer. We also do spontaneous fermentation. That's when you leave beer in a shallow tank that's called a cool ship and you let it sit overnight at a, on a cold night. It's got to be around 35 or 36 degrees and you leave it overnight and the beer is inoculated naturally with the yeast that's in the air. Yeast is around us right now. It's in your house. It's everywhere. We're breathing it right now. Um, 
and it inoculates the bear, you move it into uh, oak tanks and you let it sit for an obscenely long time, uh, sometimes up to two, three years, and see what happens. It's kind of a gamble, um, but the beer currently is tasting really good. We've never released any of those beers yet, uh, but maybe one day. So, but we are available for, if you want to learn more about Fox Farm, um, it's uh, foxfarmbeer.com. And then you can see what we have available to go, see some really nice pictures. Uh, a friend of the brewery does all the photography. He does a really great job, Jake. Um, it's a really wonderful place. It's a very small family environment. I'm one of the only people that doesn't, isn't related to someone, um, but I love working there. I've worked there for two and a half years now, um, and I couldn't be happier with the quality of the beer and the people that work there. It's a really wonderful, wonderful environment. So I recommend a uh, drive up to Eastern Connecticut, maybe go to Mystic as well. We're about 20 minutes or so from Mystic. Um, pick up some beer, um, you know, go to the ocean, that stuff. So. Um, I heard a story once about um, Albert Einstein working at Oktoberfest. Do you know anything about that? I don't, but that sounds awesome. He, I <laughs> from what I told, he was like an electrician and helped set up the electricity in the tent. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, the Oh, that's a fun fact. Um, so the amount of electricity that's needed for Oktoberfest is 13% of the city's capacity. So they have to divert 13% of the grid just to run Oktoberfest. Uh, it is a huge, it has its own um, subway station. Uh, it's still in the same place that it was held when they held the wedding. Um, it's called the Theresenweiss now, or, or the Theresenwiesen, which is um, Trace, the woman who married Ludwig's valley, or um, meadow. So the v it's mostly just called the Wiesen which is the valley. So it's in the still the same place it worked out and now it's still going. So yeah, um, I, it, I'm unsure about how they do reservations because I know sometimes the tents need reservations. Um, I know that smoking in the tents isn't allowed, I think since 2011. So that's a major change. Um, but for the most part, it's, you go and you, you know what you get, you know, you're gonna get carnival rides, they're gonna, and those are, you know, year after year, people look forward to riding the same rides. Um, you're gonna get the pork knuckle, you're gonna get the beer, it's the same beer every year. Um, it's tradition, it's culture, and that's uh, what people want. I'm sure things have changed. Um, I wish I had, I wish I had gotten Oktoberfest so I can give, I was talking to a friend of mine who had went in 2015, but he was, I think he was too young, so I think he got too drunk to tell me about, like, what they actually did. <laughs> But I was asking him today about all the things he did, and he was just like, you go, you drink a bunch, you walk around, you play some games, you ride rides, um, you just spend time with friends, you spend time with family. Um, the tents during the day, like I said, are, are very family friendly. Uh, they cater to the young as well as the very old. Um, it's a good time just to spend with family and friends. Um, and that's the most important part about Oktoberfest. So the I'm Prosit song is I'm Prosit de Gilmutlikite. Um, I did not pronounce that right again. I'm sorry <laughs> about that. Um, they will, um, we, so I used to work at Two Roads Brewing in Stratford. And if you've ever wanted to see a really great example of an American style Oktoberfest, the Two Roads Oktoberfest is a lot of fun. Uh, you get a Stein, you get, they do the different design every year. You get a beer, they do all different kinds of, they do a Meriton and a Fest beer, so you can try both. Uh, they also make an alt beer. Uh, alt beer is a Dusel, is a beer from Dusseldorf, which is nothing, nowhere near Munich, but it's nice and hoppy and amber, delicious. Um, they brew that as well, um, as well as other German beers, their Pilsner, their Hefeweizen. Um, and they hire this band and like every 15 minutes, the band sings, I'm pros it to Gilma, uh, ugh, I'm gonna, yeah. Gilma, Gilma. Kite. there we go. Commute late kite, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, and everyone sings it and knows the words. Uh, I literally know, I'm prose it, I'm prose it, and that's all I know. Um, <laughs> but everyone sings, everyone stands, they cheers. Um, it ends with like a count, like a count up. It's it's a very big part of Oktoberfest, 
and the singing and you just sing it like every if the, everyone plays it i don't know any of other um oktoberfest songs uh mostly traditional alpine um bavarian tunes uh especially during the day the brass uh the accordion um all that kind of stuff um it's a very important part of munich uh and bavarian culture is the the umpa that everyone knows um so and then at night obviously they all turn into clubs and there's electronic music <laughs> everyone dances <laughs> so i hope that answered your question i didn't but that is a huge problem because everyone breaks their steins and whatnot they are trying to get away from um they don't serve anything in gl glass bottles anymore um that is not allowed if you look at the um wikipedia page for oktoberfest there's a photo of the paul anner tent and there's just glass everywhere um the shoes that women wear, they usually wear it flat uh, with their dirndl or a small heel. So definitely, if you go to Oktoberfest, watch where you're walking. Uh, men will normally have like a leather shoe. Um, so again, watch where you're walking. Um, but yeah, the glass is a huge problem. They have moved 100% away from like anything in a glass bottle. So um, also, if you've ever, what I think it was the, one of the number one things that gets lost is Australian passports. Because <laughs> the Australians love to go to Oktoberfest. Um, so what's one of the main things that gets lost is, uh, is Australian passports. So don't, don't do that. Don't, you know, drink responsibly. If you're going to go to Oktoberfest, try, I bet it's going to be really hard, but drink responsibly. So I talked about the, so when the parades, they do a lot of horse, a lot of the breweries are uh, horse drawn and the parade has the main person rides. Um, the, uh, the Munchner Kindle rides on a horse. Um, horses are a big part of the parade. It is an agricultural fair, so um, horses and animals are um, a part of it. Um, you aren't allowed to bring your dog, so don't try to bring your dog to Oktoberfest. Um, they used to be able to, but you can't anymore. Um, but um, yeah, no, horses are a big part of the parade and big part of the agricultural aspect of Oktoberfest. I, I did not read anything about it being segregated by sex. I've um, never had any issues with that, even in the early times. Or? No, if you look at the like early like paintings, everyone's carousing and drinking together. Uh, it's not a separate uh, phenomenon. There, it's looks like everyone's having a good time together. I mean, it's the early nineteenth century. I feel like if it were maybe in the eighteenth century, it would have been. I could see that, but because of its um, creation in the early to mid 19th century. Uh, it looks like everyone's kind of, it is, and it, again, it is a family affair. So when you go with family, you bring grandmother, you know, you bring the kids. Um, so it is a, everyone's drinking together. When I watched videos, kids are drinking. Um, it's, I don't, I don't think it's super taboo to, for like the kid to have us, I think they get a smaller glass. Uh, there are lower alcohol beers they can drink. Uh, vice beer, which is about 5% or so, which is a wheat ale, uh, can be served. Um, there is the kinder beer. I, I didn't see anything about that being served, but that's like a child's beer, table beer, low alcohol, 2-3%. Uh, so for the kids to have a beer, you know, if you're 12 or in, you probably at least get a couple sips of dad or mom's beer, um, grandma or grandpa's beer. Um, Beer is just part of their culture. Bavarians drink a lot of beer. It's not something that, when beer is so ingrained in people's culture, it ceases to have a stigma. I don't mean it in a way that like everyone's getting drunk um, or so, but everyone, beer is part of the conversation. It's part of the food, uh, food and beer scene. So I think they're like, the kids to have a beer or so um, wouldn't be out of the ordinary. Um, I don't think they're like pounding, you know, Moss Krugs or anything like that. I don't think they allow that. I know the, I believe it's 18 um, across Europe, but I've seen, I've, when I've been to Europe, I've seen teens routinely drinking without a problem. So they could also do, um, there's a Rattler, which is half beer, half, uh, or spezi or whatever. Yeah, you get like beer and lemonade or lemon soda. And so it's lower alcohol. Um, those are really, really delicious. Um, Schopenhofer, that's an uh, Austrian company, makes a really great one. It's 2%. Um, great in summer. So 
um, that could be served to kids, um, any kind of Kindle beer. So, but yeah, I, I want an apple juice, a masa apple juice. That sounds <laughs> intense. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of when, you know, non-COVID times, a lot of breweries in the area will do Oktoberfest. Uh, Von Trapp in Vermont has a really phenomenal one up in Stowe. Um, two Roads Oktoberfest, two days. Uh, if you're going to go, go Sunday. Saturday gets a little rowdy. Uh, I like going on Sundays. Um, a lot of breweries will do an Oktoberfest. Harpoon um, does one in Boston and in Vermont. Um, their Oktoberfest is really great. Um, or do it yourself, you know, you have a couple people over or, you know, make some traditional foods, buy some Oktoberfest. They're really easy to find. Uh, Oktoberfest tend to show up in American markets around the end of July, early August. Uh, a lot of people get angry about that because it's still summer and they call it season creep, but drink whatever you want, whenever you want. Uh, beer is for enjoying, not ridiculing, uh, in my opinion. Uh, so I, the minute Oktoberfest around the shelf, Meritsons are one of my favorite styles. I was a huge Meritson person. Um, uh, when I was underage, my friend's brother used to buy us a six pack of Oct uh, Sam Adams Oktoberfest and we would secretly drink it without our parents knowing. And, you know, sorry, mom, but that was one of my first like gateway beers. You know, everyone has a beer that they have and they go, whoa, what's this? I love this. I want more of it. Um, and for me, Sam Adams Oktoberfest was kind of the gold standard. I really, really enjoyed that beer uh, all through college and even today. Um, I think that beer is phenomenal. So, um, you know, try a couple out. Um, they all taste different, even though they look incredibly similar. You know, um, they couldn't be more different in flavor. Um, some are more grainy. Some are more uh, caramelly or sweet. Um, some have more floral aspects, are hoppier, um, and you can, I really like, I always go and I'll buy like four or five Oktoberfests. My husband and I will split them, and we'll pick which one we really like. I'm a huge Paul Anner Oktoberfest, the Meriton, um, and their Fest beer are both phenomenal. I don't, I drank them, so I didn't have them for tonight, um, but, you know, just my, one of my philosophies with beer is to try, just keep trying, go to a beverage store that you really like, that you respect and pull some beer off the shelf. I will say, if you're going to buy beer singles off the shelf or any beer, make sure to look at a Best Buy or Born on Date. Um, every beer should have one. So like Best Beer is right here for Bitburger. It says it's Best Buy March 27th, 2021. So it's probably brewed um, in late March, um, breweries will on the bottom have cans. It'll be on the bottom here or on the side. Um, make sure with Oktoberfest, they can be older, a couple months or so, three months, four months, but don't buy a lot of brewery. A lot of beer shops will try to like bamboozle you into buying last year's. Um, it's going to taste kind of papery and old and sweet. It's going to lose a lot of its luster. So if you're going to buy beer um, or any beer, uh, check the Born On um, or Best Buy. Um, also try to buy it cold. Beer retains its flavor better when it's kept cold. Um, if it gets warm again and then cold again, that's a myth. Beer can get cold and then warm again. It's totally fine. Um, don't freeze it or boil it. Then it'll change the flavor structure. But for the most part, beer... Um, if you get beer, you buy it cold and leave it out and then put it back in the fridge, you've done absolutely nothing wrong. Um, that's going to taste totally fine. Um, so yeah, just try and explore. That's the best part about beer is that there's so much flavor and so, you know, beer tastes like chocolate. There's beer that tastes like anything. Um, and just keep exploring. That's the best part about beer. So, so I am just because I work there. Um, that's not one of the reasons why I would tout their product, but uh, Two Roads makes a beer de Noel called Holiday Ale. Uh, it's a, a beer de Noel is a French Christmas beer uh, made uh, usually a, a leading up to the holidays. It's amber colored, super drinkable. I don't really even know how to describe it. It just tastes so good. Um, very ref not refreshing. I haven't had one in a while. It sells out very, very quickly. They don't make a lot of it. Um, but I highly recommend it's going to come out shortly. Uh, Christmas beers 
beers always are released about six weeks before the actual holiday. Um, so pumpkin beers are out now. Um, but with Christmas coming up, Christmas beers are starting to come out now. Um, I really like um, the Two Roads Holiday Ale. I think it's a great Christmas beer. Um, with darker, with when it gets darker and it gets colder, um, higher alcohol stuff's never a bad thing. <laughs> Um, I really like uh, r Belgian strong dark ales or Belgian quads, um, anything by Travis Rochefort, which is very easy to find. Um, and uh, Belgian beers tend to have a very long shelf life. So if you buy uh, Travis Rochefort makes three beers, they make a six, eight and a 10. That just means how strong they are. Um, so uh, essentially the six is 6%, the eight is 8%, the 10 is 10%. Um, any of those beers, it's usually four or five dollars a bottle. They're small, it's about 12 ounces, uh, but those are really nice in the winter. Um, Travis Richford's delicious. Um, what, a lot of Belgian breweries also make Christmas beers. Um, St. Bernardus, which is a brewery in Western Belgium, makes a Bernardus Christmas ale. That's really, really great. Um, Something for something completely different, Sierra Nevada makes a wet hop IPA. Uh, what that means is they pick the hops and use them within 24 hours. They throw in the whole hop. Uh, it's called Celebration. So it's a 7% darker, it's not a New England IPA. It's dark, it's bitter, it's filtered. Um, that's a great beer. It comes out usually in late October. Uh, it's one of my favorite Christmas seasonals. Um, you can drink it now and it's going to taste, you know, fresh and piney, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a little bit of grapefruit peel and whatnot from the hops. And then the m more you save it, the less the hop, uh, the hop flavor goes down, the sweetness from the malt comes up. It's a really nice beer to have at, um, the holiday season, um, and different than any kind of darker high alcohol stuff because it is bitter. So. Um, so they've traced beer back. The recent, the recent findings is that they found it in China in like 9,000 BC. Uh, they don't really know how malt got to China since China is more of a rice culture. Um, they think it was traversed from um, the Fertile Crescent where beer really took off Iran, Iraq, Middle East. Um, and was used for festivals similar to Oktoberfest, weddings, funerals, and the like. Beer always has kind of been at the forefront of any kind of celebration, which I really like about beer. Um, beer is for good, beer is for bad, beer is for having um, when things either go beer, good or bad. Um, a brewery in Delaware called Dogfish Head brews a beer called Midas Touch. Uh, it was a collaboration with the Philadelphia uh, Natural History Museum. They went into King Midas's tomb took a pot, scraped it, and did a scientific analysis of what was in it, and then made a beer based off of the findings. So they made a higher alcohol beer that has wine grapes, saffron, and honey in it. Uh, and that's probably what they were drinking. They were making beer and then flavoring it with things that they had available at the time, similar to what we do now, you know, where fruits in season, we add it to beer or local honey um, or other such, you know, local ingredients. Um, it's actually a really, really phenomenal beer. They brew it once a year. It's pretty easy to find. It comes in a four pack. Um, I highly recommend it if you want to try it. I actually really, really like Minus Touch. I think it's a great beer. Um, it's, Beer history has an issue with being a lot of like hearsay, built on myth, built on idealistic like thoughts. Um, so it's not really where beer came from. We know beer came from, the earliest is from China. We know that beer really flourished from the Fertile Crescent in Mesopotamia um, by 3000 BC. You know, beer, it was one of the first things that was taxed. The first tax laws ever are about beer. Um, recipes are well grounded by 3000 BC. Women are the most, are mainly the brewers. Uh, until the Industrial Revolution, women were the main brewers uh, in most beer cultures from South America uh, to the alewives of, uh, of England uh, to the Fertile Crescent.
so to Egypt. So it was a very important part of many, many, many cultures. So, well, I want to thank everyone for listening to my talk. Um, Prost. Um, if you have any other questions or um, want to get in touch with me, uh, my website is pintsandpanels.com uh, or uh, I'm on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram uh, on, at, at Pints and Panels. You can give me a message that way. Um, uh, or you can email me, msauter at pintsandpanels.com. I'm happy to talk beer. I always want to talk beer. I never stop talking about beer. It's a little bit of an obsession, but it's okay. Um, thank you so much for coming out tonight uh, and learning about Oktoberfest and uh, yeah, prost.